We've been doing a series on what does healthy look like and how do I get there. And with that, it's how do I meet my needs that I have. And we've always presented 12 needs built into every human being. How do we meet those needs in healthy ways? And what we have done as far as a background to all of that is what happens in complex trauma is those needs don't get met at all or they don't get met consistently. When a child grows up not feeling safe or having parents that aren't there for them, they have a lot of needs that aren't met in a healthy way. And so what they then begin to do is to try and meet those needs somehow. And they usually find unhealthy ways of meeting those needs. So recovery becomes figuring out what does healthy look like and learning healthy tools so that you can begin to meet those needs in a healthy way. So this is part seven. And I'm not being able to switch. Can you just make sure? There we go. Oh. Okay, you're going to be my flicker tonight, I guess. Um, okay, so tonight we're going to look at one of the, I would think, one of the hardest ones for me to explain because it's kind of a concept. And it's that of having a purpose in life. So a lot of people that come out of complex trauma, as I talk to them, there's two things that I hear all the time. Number one is I don't know who I am. And secondly, I don't know what I'm good at. And so part of that is I do want my life to matter. I don't want to just be a taker all my life or just messed up all my life. I would love to get up to a place in my life where I'm able to help others, but I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what I would be able to do. And so that becomes an issue. The second thing that I've shared in the past is as studies are being done now on the millennial generation that's coming up that are your children, um, what they're finding with them is really two things that are coming out of kids that are hooked on video games or their cell phones and social media. Number one, they're lonelier than ever. And secondly, they don't have a clue what they're here for. And they have a total sense of no purpose. And that, for many, is becoming a very haunting thing because what they realize is something deep inside of them wants to have a purpose that matters. And so that's what I want to talk about tonight. And I, I don't, don't want to go into a huge philosophical thing that would bore you to tears. I want to try to break it down into things that we can quickly catch on to, see the truth of, just inherently have a sense that this is right. And then begin to build and to show a lot about how complex trauma really messes with this whole desire to become healthy in this area of having a purpose. So I, I put down three possible purposes that we all can have. So number one is we could live for the purpose of I'm going to just live for myself. I'm going to live for my desires. I'm going to live to indulge everything I want and make life all about me. And that, I'm sure, will make me happy. Because if I meet my needs, I feel pleasure. So if I just live to live only to meet my needs, then I surely will be the happiest person in the world. So that's one possibility. The second one is, so the first one is, I'm going to, my purpose is inward. The second is my purpose is outward. I'm going to give my life to serve other people, to help people, animals, environment, get involved in causes, and I'm going to give and help. And that's a, a viable option. And the third is I want to get my sense of purpose vertically upward so that if you have a higher power, I want to know what he wants to do in the world and I want to be part of that. Or you could have an uh, all three, some variation of those. 
But what I love about working with people coming out of trauma and addiction is they have tried number one. They have tried A. And they have lived with themselves as the center of the universe. And they have fed every desire, sex, drugs, parties, all of that kind of stuff. And they thought it was making them happy, but after a while it made them empty and then brought them to this very dark, painful place. And they realize living totally for self does not ultimately lead to lasting happiness. So if you take that... Then you begin to go, okay, then what is the purpose? So before I move on, think of this. If you look at our culture today, the stuff that is happening as far as wars, as far as our environmental problems, it's somebody in a position of authority who lives by option A. I'm going to use people, I'm going to use things to feed my greed, to feed every desire I don't care who I hurt. I don't care if I rape this world. I am going to use my authority to get everything I want. And when you look at that abuse of authority that has that mindset, you don't just have an empty person. You have a person who inflicts tremendous pain on others and on our environment and on the world in general. And it leads to war death, famine, all kinds of stuff. So living for A, I don't really need to spend a lot of time on because most of you have tried to do that. And you have found out it does not lead to happiness, so I must have a different purpose in life, okay? So let's go to some facts that you can consider about this whole purpose thing. So here's how I just, I want to break it down. I think everybody I work with has a sense that there's good and evil. We have a dark side, and yet we have a side that wants to love. But we have a side that wants to be very selfish. And those come in conflict internally, and we have a lot of internal wars that go on inside of us because of that. We realize the same is true in society. There are good and there is evil, okay? So if you think of that, then you go, what happens if the bad, the dark, the evil is allowed to reign and nobody stops it? Well, then you end up with the people in power getting their own way and they look happy for a little while, but nobody else is happy. And after a while, even they aren't happy. So you can go back to a World War II scenario where you have a Hitler who says, I want my way and evil reigns and it spreads and the destruction that happens comes out of that. So if evil reigns, it makes the world unsafe. It takes joy out of the world. It causes more pain than pleasure and everything gets darker and darker. So back away from that and think of how we have structured our world as far as the institutions within a society. So what is one of the main purposes or should be the main purposes of government? To stop evil. To encourage good. What is one of the main purposes or should be of police? To stop evil. To encourage good. So all of those things are there. What should be one of the main purposes of a family? To stop evil and encourage good. What should be one of the main purposes of churches throughout our country? To discourage and stop evil and encourage good. Okay, so now you have a problem. What happens if the government's not doing that? What happens if the police aren't doing that? What happens if families aren't doing that? And what happens if churches are all ingrown and only wrapped up in their own stuff? you got a society where evil begins to spread. And that is kind of what we're facing in our culture today. Let me give you another thing. I don't know if you ever understood what the, why we say university. 
So why do we give that title to schools where people go after high school? So uni is one, versity is many. And so what it realizes is we live in a world where there's all kinds of different areas that we can study, math, science, etc., etc. But if we're going to have a good world, we need a unifying thing that brings all of those together so they all work to, de- to get the world to operate by a design that promotes good and hinders evil. That's the meaning of university. That's what universities were created to help do. So let's get all these diverse fields growing and learning, but let's bring together all of that so that we work together as to how then should life operate so that good triumphs and evil is put out. So that's every institution by design was made to promote good and hinder evil. So what happens when you live in a world where that's not happening? Well, it comes down to us as individuals. And that's where you go, what can I do to help promote good and hinder evil? And so when you look at purpose for your life, to me it helps to think of it along those lines so that there's something that I can do that eventually fulfills that grand purpose that really everything should be working towards but sadly isn't. But maybe I can have a small role in helping that happen. And that to me is a great way to summarize purpose. So you're stopping the advance of corruption. So let me give you three metaphors that might help you. So number one that I enjoy is as evil spreads, it's like darkness spreads. And so what can I do? I can shine my little light. And I can let people see what healthy looks like, what it means to be a person who advances good, who lives a good life, so that they would be attracted to that light. And they would say, we're tired of darkness. There's an emptiness and pain there. We like what we see here and we're drawn to it. And so that is one way that you can look at your purpose is you can be a little candle in a dark place. The second thing is to think about salt. So back in the days before refrigeration, they salted meat so that it wouldn't spoil. So salt stopped the corrupting process that normally takes place when something like meat is left out in the air with the bacteria that floats around. And so they found out that salt stops the corruption process from taking place. So that's where ham originally came from, if you didn't know that. It was all designed back then before refrigeration. And then people said, we like the taste of this, and so let's keep doing it even after we got refrigeration. But here's what I want you to understand, is salt does no good sitting in a salt shaker. Salt has to be in contact with the meat that could decay. And the problem that we have today in our society is a lot of people want to stop evil and have good happen, but they stay in their little salt shakers and never get involved. They never touch lives that need to be touched. And so if we want to fulfill a purpose, we can see ourselves like salt getting out of the salt shaker and developing some relationships with people who are needing help, who are heading further into decay and corruption, and our life might be the thing that stops that and makes them want to change. But there has to be some meaningful relationships with people. We can't stay in our safe little places. And then the third one is yeast. 
And again, it was an illustration from the old world, and we still use today. So let's say you've got a great big thing of flour. You've added your water and your sugar, and you've got it all worked up. Nothing's going to happen unless you add a little bit of yeast. And you don't have to add a whole lot, just a tiny little bit. And then slowly, it will begin to infiltrate, infiltrate that great big mass. And before you know it, you'll see that influence changing that mass because the, the dough will start to rise and get bigger and bigger. And so the point with yeast is it's hidden. You can't even see its effect at times, but it slowly, slowly works by spreading the good influence. And pretty soon as it spreads, it takes over more and more territory until the whole batch of wheat is affected. So again, it doesn't, one little person can make a huge difference. You don't need millions of people. Secondly, you got to be in contact. And thirdly, you might not see results right away. But as you patiently continue to impact, it will spread. And that is to me what our purpose is in life, is to be light, salt, or yeast, or all three take your pick. Now, having said that, you can see that some people don't like light shining in their darkness. They like their darkness. And they like drawing people into their darkness. It gives them more power. And so you, if you're a light, are seen as a threat. You're seen as an enemy, and there could be a battle. There could be conflict. And so if we're going to fulfill our purpose, you have to be prepared for opposition. You have to be prepared for the fact that not everybody's going to like you. And not, some are going to resist what you're trying to offer. Now let me take you a wee bit further. I think there's a danger happening in Canada today where we're wanting our government to do all of the changes in our society. We want them to fix everything. Do you realize that that was never really the original design of a government? What was to be the greatest influencer of children? It wasn't to be the public schools. It wasn't to be other organizations that take kids in for sports, etc. The greatest influencer in the next generation is not the government, not the schools. It's mom and dad. There is nobody that has more power to influence the next generation. But what I see in our culture today is parents who are struggling wanting the government to pick up the slack and do everything to rescue their kids. And so if I'm going to be effective, I have to realize I have influence, powerful influence. I decide whether it's going to be a good influence or a bad influence. And it will only be a good influence if I'm getting healthy. And we'll come back to that in just a little bit. The next thing that I think is important to say in all of this is I can't do everything, but I can do something. And so a lot of people run off from one cause to the next and they don't finish any cause. They just, oh, there's a new need, run off for a couple weeks doing that. Oh, there's a new need, run off and do another thing. And they're, they're running around like a chicken with their head cut off. You can't do everything. You can be concerned, but you have to be able to say, this is where I can best make a difference. So this is where I will put my energy and I'll have to restrict myself to that because if I spread myself too thin, I won't make a difference anywhere. And that is a very important thing. Okay, so let's come to challenges that come out of complex trauma. Number one, shame. So shame can work in a couple different ways when it comes to fulfilling a purpose for your life. So let's say that you begin to think, I think I'm a good teacher. I want to get involved teaching at React. That's what I think I'd be good at. 
Okay, number one problem shame will have is, oh, I don't know if I can do this. What happens if I make a mistake? Oh, if I make a mistake, like I'm going to blow it and people look down at me. Okay, I won't even try. Because unless I can do it perfectly the first time, I'm not going to try. So shame keeps a lot of people frozen, not trying to fulfill their purpose because of fear. Okay? But then there's some people with shame who feel inferior, but they're in their fantasy world. They dream of teaching auditoriums with thousands of people in them making this huge difference in the world, like they're God's gift to the world. That's their fantasy life. And they go there all the time. They just don't do anything in real life. That can happen. Others go to the other extreme. I need to fight my shame, which means in their mind, I need to have a big position. I'm not going to do any grunt work, behind the scenes work. That's for losers. I'm not a loser. I got to be the president of this company. And so they go to that extreme and that can come out of complex trauma. And so what they're saying is my significance comes from my position. Not my significance comes from influencing a life behind the scenes or in the front row, but I have to be in a certain position to feel that I am worth something. And then another thing that comes out of shame is some people gravitate. I want to help out. I want to help out because then people will pat me on the back and give me validation. And so they're not working on themselves. They're just running to help out everywhere because they need validation. And so that is not the way to solve shame. But for them, that's the method that they're using. So shame can be a big issue. Second thing, one of the 60 characteristics of complex trauma that we teach is great starters, poor finishers. And I have, I, don't, I can't even count the number of clients that have started to help in more causes and never stayed long enough to make a big difference. They've started thousands of things, never finished one. And that can easily happen. And so what can happen if a person starts to get involved? They're flying high. They're going on adrenaline. This is exciting. This is new. I can't believe the difference I'm making. A month later, this is turning into a bit of a routine. And it's getting boring. I need to find something more exciting. And they move on to the next cause. Huge problem. Others, they get into a situation where they're helping and then they turn into their narcissist self again where they say, everybody pat me on the back. Everybody notice how great I am and they use their service as a way to feed their narcissism. And that can be a, a terrible thing for them and people under them. Okay, next thing, when people that I work with that come out of complex trauma... When I give them a position of authority, I know it can go one of two ways. For some, they're ready for it, and they just accept it, and they continue to give and serve. Others, they're not quite ready for it and goes to their head. And they go, oh, Tim picked me to be the boss around here now, so I'm a big shot. And they go back to being their mom or their dad. And they abuse that authority because they haven't sufficiently learned the tools to manage the struggles that go with having that kind of authority. So that can be an issue for a lot of people as well. Next thing, if you come out of complex trauma, you've probably come out of a life where you've had to fight every inch of the way. Nothing's been handed to you. It has been uphill climb. It has been hard work to get where you are today. Some people get to recovery and they have an expectation that goes, if I get healthy, it'll all be easy from here on out. So I'm going to get healthy and find a job of service where there's zero problems. 
Everybody will always agree with me. Nobody will ever cause drama. Nobody will ever give me a hard time. That's what I'm looking for. And so they get a job and they think it's that way for two weeks and they get their first little hiccup. I'm done with this. This is sick. And I'm going to find something else. So that is another issue. Next one, in case you didn't know, there was a lot of issues coming out of complex trauma in this area. Many people from complex trauma have lived in survival mode for so long, which means in survival mode you can never relax. You push yourself and push yourself until you burn out. And then you get into service and you don't know how to take care of yourself, so you push yourself and push yourself until you burn out. And sadly, I've seen that happen many times. So I don't know if any of those apply to you, but probably some of them do. Okay, so how do I find out what my specific purpose is? So here's the illustration that I th helps me and I hope will help you. Think of a physical body. So what is the purpose of my body? Well, you go, my eyes got one purpose, my ears got another purpose, my tongue's got another purpose. Like I got multiple purposes happening within this body, but now they all work together to accomplish what the brain wants to accomplish. So what you're doing now in finding your purpose is not, I can't be the whole body, but I can be an eye, I can be an ear, I can be a tongue. Which one am I? And then I got to work with others so that together we form a body that accomplishes good things. So think of the specific purpose that you have within the body, but never lose sight of the big purpose the body has. So the big purpose is to encourage growth and good and to stop evil, to be light, salt, or yeast. That's the big purpose. But within the body, you might have a job where you are a tongue and you talk. But you might have a job where you're an ear and you're just a good listener to people. You might have a job where you're a stomach. Nobody ever sees you, but you got an important job behind the scenes. And so when you think of a purpose, you think of there's all kinds of different pieces that must come together to work together if this body is going to be able to fulfill its greater purpose. So that to me is a helpful, helpful illustration. So here's where I began in my life trying to figure out my purpose. The first thing is, what is my passion? What gets me excited? What kind of stokes my inner fire? And so stop and you think about that. Because most of us deep down inside have something that we, if we could just do this, that drives us, that excites us, that fuels our love and our passion, Try to find that out. Now, you may not know that yet, and that's okay. That may take time for that to surface in you. So go to the next thing. What are my natural talents and abilities? What am I good at? So you wouldn't expect somebody that can't dribble a basketball to play on a basketball team and be good at it. So find out what are you naturally good at. So some of you have a very artistic flair. Some of you couldn't draw your way out of a whatever. You just have zero ability. Some of you are super analytical. Some of you are detail freaks. Some of you are easygoing but great at connecting with people and making them feel safe. So begin to look at what is it that I'm good at. Now you might not know that yet. And so we're going to look at it in just a minute. Now in recovery, you begin to try different things until you find out what you're good at. And then ask somebody who knows you well, what do you think I'm good at? What do you see as my potential? And so all the time when I'm working with clients and counseling and teaching, 
my radar is processing what are their skills and abilities. Would this person be a good teacher? No, not them. They should be an accountant. And I'm looking to get a sense of what every person's gifts and abilities are. So start there. Then how do I progress and fulfill my purpose? So once you get a sense of what it is, or you think it is, start to get training. Start to look to be more effective. Try things. Volunteer. Read books. Take courses. Do things that help you develop your gifts and abilities. You don't expect somebody who's never dribbled a basketball, even though they have basketball skills, you don't expect them to never have to practice and be in the NBA. There has to be practice. There has to be discipline of practice. There has to be bringing coaches into your life who can teach you and help you and show you things. All of that is important. Okay, can't stop there. We are in a society today where that is the focus. Learn information and that will make you effective. You want to know what some of the most dangerous people in the world are? Smart people who are sick. So you are not going to be effective unless you have knowledge, skill, and health internally. You have to be coming, become a healthier person. So get into a program like React or something else where you're learning about yourself. You're working on some of your wounds, some of your unhealthy patterns, and you're getting healthier and healthier. Now let me take that a little bit further. Getting healthy is not just about developing honesty and reliability and those kind of things. It also includes your attitudes and your motives. So if you're going to be effective, you need a humble attitude that respects people. You can't walk in and have a better than thou attitude with your nose in the air and say, listen to me, you dumbos, I'll teach you a thing or two because I'm smart. No, you have an attitude that is right. So take that to parenting. Do you want to know what I see messes up a lot of parents? It's not that they don't know enough. It's they don't have the right attitudes. And they're not healthy in the attitude department. They can tell their kids all the right things to do, but your kids don't hear what you say if it doesn't match your attitudes. Your attitudes carry the initial influence and the greatest influence in your child's life. And if they sense your attitudes are wrong, they don't care about what you say. And so you have to begin there. Now, I've worked in this field long enough to know that most people out of complex trauma, it's all or nothing. And what that means when it comes to motive is, if I can't do this with 100% pure motive, I'm totally failing. Well, I tell clients all the time, I don't know that I've done one thing in my life with 100% pure motive. It might be 97% pure, but there's always a little bit of bad motive stuff in there. So don't expect perfection. Just expect or want your motive to continue to get better and better. Okay, next thing. <clears throat> Part of growing and being effective is being willing to start with the grunt work. To be, will be willing to start with the Joe Jobs the jobs that you maybe look down on. That's where you begin. And that has to have with it an attitude of humility. And that becomes such a key attitude if you're ever going to be effective. I have seen a lot of people push to be on a bigger stage than they're ready for. And what happens when they get on a big stage when they're not ready for? 
they crash and burn. And often they do a lot of damage. So you don't get to a big stage in one step. You start doing grunt work, and then you learn and develop both skills and character and attitudes until you're ready for a bigger stage. So re remember that. Next thing, effectiveness is about what you know, about your character, about your motives, but you got to stick at it. Effectiveness is about perseverance, about sticking at stuff, faithfully doing the same stuff day after day, days you don't feel like it, days you do feel like it. What is it that messes up people's ability to be good parents? They only parent when they feel like parenting. And a good parent does it on days they don't feel like doing it. And consistency, faithfulness is such a key part of being effective in your purpose. Next thing is you may not see the results of what you're doing in the next five minutes. You might not see it for years. You might be like that yeast. But what happens with complex trauma? Okay, I, I'm involved in service. How come I don't see any results? Oh, uh, well, I'll quit. No, you sometimes you work faithfully for years before you see any results. So I tell clients all the time and volunteers, a lot of what I do is plant seeds. Now, when you plant seeds, you don't see it start shooting out of the ground in the next hour. It takes time before you start to see the results. So you have to have more than an instant gratification perspective if you're going to be effective. Finally, if you're going to be effective, you have to figure out the balance between serving and giving and taking care of yourself. Because if you're not learning healthy self-care, you're going to burn yourself out and soon be no good to anybody and potentially do a lot of damage. So, yeah. So welcome to the Christian part. Um, if you haven't been part of this, we're on a bit of a, a second type of series, and it's based on people asking me all the time, where do you find this complex trauma stuff in the Bible? And so that sent me on a journey that has looked through the Bible to where do I see complex trauma. And so I came to the best illustration that I have in the Bible of complex trauma, and it was the nation of Israel were slaves in Egypt for generations. And as a result of being the slaves that were oppressed terribly, there was uh, killing by slave masters, etc., genocide. They had terrible, terrible trauma. So when they came out of Egypt, they were like many addicts coming into recovery. They thought, now that we've stopped using, everything's going to be great. And they didn't realize how all of that trauma changed them to ways of survival that made healthy life impossible. And they had become very sick, bitter people in all of those years of being slaves. And so what God does as he brings them out is first shows them how unhealthy they are so that the problem wasn't for God getting them out of Egypt. The problem was God getting Egypt out of them. And so God begins a journey with them that is going to gradually help them face their underlying issues and heal. And so we've been showing that the sequence that God presents the story in is fascinating because it builds off of what I would teach here as the foundational steps taking person needs to take if they're going to get healthy. And so God begins by saying, you got to trust. And that's what people from trauma don't want to do is trust. And then God says, we got to look at you and understand how unhealthy you are. And they go, we don't want to look at ourselves. That's, that's what we've been running from. So you got to take that look inward. And then God says, 
It's going to be a struggle, so you better get used to fighting. And he takes them there. Now he's brought them to the Mount Sinai where the Ten Commandments were received. And what most of us think of when we think of Mount Sinai and the Ten Commandments, so if you ever watched the Ten Commandments on TV, the old version, there was the lightning and thunder and dark, and, and it was a scary type of thing. And we think of the Ten Commandments as God being kind of this distant, cold deity that's giving all these rules and going to punish us if we don't. And so what we've been doing is trying to understand what was God doing at Mount Sinai because they spent a lot of time there. And so the first thing that we showed is God set up Mount Sinai to be a Jewish wedding ceremony. And so when God gave the Ten Commandments, it was wedding vows. And what he was saying is the first thing I want you to know is I love you at a depth of commitment that you've never experienced in your life. But then he says, the other reason I'm giving you the Ten Commandments is so you will know what healthy looks like. You've grown up in a society that's not just, that's not healthy. You don't have an idea what healthy relationships and healthy living looks like. I want to help you understand that so you can have a meaningful life, a, a great life. Now he goes on to the next thing. And this is one of the, if you have ever tried to read through Exodus, you come to this next chapter and you fall asleep. It's so boring. Because he says, now I want you to build a church for me. And he gives them detail after detail, the type of thread, the color. And you're going, this is terrible. Why is this in the Bible? So you need to understand this because this is absolutely beautiful. God is giving them one more thing to show them how much he loves them. So here's what I want you to understand up front. What does God realize people from trauma need more than anything else and that needs to be emphasized and re-emphasized? That they're loved by God. That they are loved. That they are loved. That that love goes deep. And that has to be repeated. And I go, that is so true. Because the people that I work with all the time, they go, I don't believe anybody would love me. Especially God. That is a fact. They just can't get into their head. And so that's why God repeats it in different ways. So what he's going to do now with this next thing. So it's called a tabernacle is what he wants them to build. And the word tabernacle just means a tent, but it had special significance. So God borrows from the culture. So the Pharaoh at that time was adored by the people, especially the army of Egypt, for this reason. Most of the pharaohs sent their armies out to battle, and the pharaohs stayed in their castles safe and sound totally disconnected from the struggles of the common people and the war and the dangers. One day, this pharaoh came and he pit pitched a tent amongst his soldiers with their tents, and he became one of them. And he said, I'm moving out of my great palace, and I'm coming to pitch a tent and live in the same dwelling as you're living living in the same conditions you're living in so that you know I'm one of you, so that you know that I care. And the people loved him for that. This was somebody that cared enough about them to enter into their world and to try and understand their world and be part of it. And that was such an important piece. So it was a great act. Now let me just take you to a verse in the Bible. When Jesus came into the world in John 1, it says, so the word Jesus became flesh. So it's just in the first verses said, this is God. So God became flesh and pitched his tent among us or tabernacled among us. And so what is it saying is 
this God is a God that comes and builds his tent right with us. And that's what he's doing at Mount Sinai. He is saying to Moses, I'm the great God over everything that's infinite, but I want to come and pitch my tent among you. And I want to be with you. And I want to be part of your experience. To the people of that culture, nothing communicated love like that because it was willing to humble itself to the conditions of people way under it. And that's part one. Part two is the way he sets up this tabernacle, he sets it up like a house. So if you think of a house, you would have some people that you would invite into the entryway of your house. You're not letting them an inch past the entryway. You got a boundary there that say, no further, buddy. I'll be polite, but you're not getting into my living room. But then you would have a living room and you would invite close friends into that. But then you'd have the bedroom. And only one person would go there with you. The most intimate. And so the way he sets up a tabernacle is he's got an entryway, a living room, and an intimate bedroom. And what he says is, I want to show you how to have an intimate relationship with me. Because I want that. And so the house that I'm setting up is what a bride would do, or a husband would do when he was getting ready to get married. He would go away during the engagement period and build a house so that he could bring his bride to and live with her. And so God's just had a wedding ceremony with Israel and had vows. And now he says, I've built a house. And now we're going to celebrate married life together. So he is just doing everything he can to say, I want you to get, I love you. Get it through your head. And I want to live with you in an intimate, loving relationship. Okay. So there's the tabernacle, that thing that's got smoke coming out of it. So it was covered by animal hides and it was a tent. Okay. Now, here's the first thing I want you to understand about this. As you look at the tabernacle, what God then says to Moses is the tabernacle will be situated at the very center of your camp when you stop to camp. And then you're going to have the people put their tents on the four sides. But I'm going to be in the center. Secondly, everybody's tent opening is going to face the center. So that when you get out of bed in the morning and put the flap of your tent back, what's the first thing you're going to see? The house. The tent where God is. And so what is God saying to the people? I want you to realize that if our life is going to work and your life is going to be meaningful, I have to be the center. But secondly, build into your life a way that every morning when you get up, the first thing that you face and deal with and look to is me. And if you will learn to do that, you will go a long way in becoming healthy people, people that are capable of giving love. So let me present this in just a little different way. People from complex trauma who haven't experienced lots of healthy love become parents, and they realize you can't give love if you don't have any love in the cup. So love is given when it's an overflow of what you're experiencing. And so what God is saying is if you want to become loving people and love your children, you got to learn how to accept love from me. And as you accept love from me, it fills up your cup. And then it can overflow into all the relationships of your life. I told you there's the entryway, the living room, and then the bedroom. So how how that was laid out was the outer courtyard where anybody could come and be part of that. And then there was what they called the holy place, what I'm calling the living room. 
And only people who were committed to a relationship with God could go into there. And then the inner bedroom, that was to be available because of what Jesus did so that all of us could enter into intimacy. But back then, nobody could go into the bedroom except the priest once a year. Because God wanted them to realize, you don't earn your way into my bedroom. You let me change you and provide for you through what Jesus did, and then you can come. Okay, so in that living room, the holy place, there were three things. So there was a menorah or a candlestick that was burning all the time, okay? Then there was this table called the table of showbread, and it had 12 loaves of bread, one for each tribe of Israel. They had 12 tribes in Israel. And then there was an altar of incense where perfume was ignited and it made this beautiful aroma. So those three things are fascinating and what I want to talk about because it shows us how to have a healthy life and how to have a relationship with God. But they're set up each one that God does certain things for me, but I got to do certain things as well. Okay, so let's start with the menorah. I don't know how many of you have seen a Jewish menorah, but they have seven branches. And at the top where the candle goes in, they look like an almond. And so their design of the seven branches is it looks like an almond tree. Okay, so the, the point of a men menorah was three things. So number one, we live in a dark world and we need light. And that means we need guidance. We often don't know where to go with our life. We need God to guide us. So when Jesus came into the world, on the day when the menorah had a special ceremony, he stood up in the crowd of people and said, I am the menorah. I am the light of the world. I'm the one that this pointed to way back at Mount Sinai. The second thing with the light is we need the light of truth. So we live in a world where there's lots of lies. We live in brains from complex trauma that have a lot of distortions and lies. And if we're ever going to get healthy, we need to be confronted and have our brains reshaped by truth so that the lies begin to disappear. We need the light. Then it went to the almond. Now it's important that the word almond in Hebrew was very close to the word that meant be on guard. So when you said almond, it could be interpreted in a context, be on guard. So here's what it meant with the menorah. God is on guard watching you even at night when you sleep. He's always on guard. But secondly, if you want to do well in life, you be on guard. You take advantage of the light God gives in truth and guard and guidance, and you follow it, and you be alert to danger and lies. You've got a part in this too. God's just not going to magically protect you. So that's the menorah. Secondly, you went to this table that had 12 loaves of bread. And what that was saying to Israel is God wants to have supper with you. And what, what that meant in that culture is your deepest conversations happened around a meal. Meals were for intimacy. Eating became an opportunity to get honest and share at a deep level. And what God was saying was a couple of things. Number one, I want to have a meal with you every day. But then when Jesus came into the world, you know what he said one day? I am the bread. And what he was saying is, you need to bring me into your life to meet your deep spiritual needs. You need to have God as the one that feeds your soul. And so to do that, 
you got to take time every day to feed on God, to feed on the bread that he's provided so that you get spiritually strong and you communicate with God. So you need to have that eating with God as a daily part of your journey. You don't expect a child to come into the world and you say, I fed you once, you're good. You know you have to eat and then eat again and eat again. And that's what God was saying, is eating needs to be a part of your daily life for energy and for intimacy. And then the third thing was this altar of incense. So every day they would come in and light the incense on fire and it would make this beautiful aroma that would fill that room with these beautiful smells. And it, it symbolized two things to the people of Israel. Number one, it symbolized prayer. And so you even still see that in some churches today when people want to symbolize praying to God, they light an incense thing or a candle. And that symbolizes prayer to God. And what it was saying was, God, I need not just to eat, but I need to communicate. I need you. I need dependence on you. I need to be surrendered to you. So I need to make prayer a part of my life, not just setting aside five minutes, but all of my life throughout the day, talking to God about stuff as I go along. Second thing that it meant was worship. So I bring praise and thanksgiving to God, and that's just a sweet smell to God when we say, God, thank you for being gracious to me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for helping me. I just want my life to be a gift back to you. So I'll give that through verbal stuff, but I'll give that through service. I'll give that through living in a way that you've designed. All of that, I want to be constantly having my life say thank you and have an attitude of worship. So do you see what God is doing there? He is saying, if you're going to have a good relationship with me and grow in love, you need light and you need to be on guard. You need food every day and you need prayer and worship as part of what becomes your life. And as you do that, you will find you get stronger and that you get closer to me in ways that you've never expected. And then, as all of that is happening, love is settling down and you're experiencing it and feeling it and it's changing you. And so that's what God's trying to design. He's, just, he's not trying to make a bunch of dumb rules that you got to go through. He's saying... I want to make the best life possible and I'm going to put in picture form what that would look like on a daily basis. So God bless you as you continue this journey with the children of Israel and becoming healthy.